You're watching Go Wheel with John Larson, and today we're covering my Wagoneer build, uh, Resto Mod, I guess you'd say. Hey, John here, and today we're going over a Wagoneer that I probably saved from going to the Crusher. Um, this thing looked really terrible when we first got it. Uh, all the weather stripping was rotten. It was, it had severe water damage inside, lots of rust all over the body panels, dents all over. Um, the paint was faded white and the, the wood grain had completely faded away. And so <laughs> it just looked terrible. It was kind of embarrassing to have in the driveway, but it was still so cool that I loved it. But I, uh, I knew I had to get it mechanically sound before we could do any cosmetic work. And so I think I'll go over the history of how I got it first and then maybe go over the mechanical procedures and then some of the cosmetic stuff and then the plans for the future. And so uh, for the history, I got this thing from a guy off of Craigslist, older gentleman uh, that had a bunch of cars on his property and needed a motor and a transmission for his Dub J, which is a 99 through 04 Grand Cherokee. He, uh, I had a V8 motor and a transmission that I'd yanked out of a rig. He, he wanted to buy it. We start talking. We ended up talking for like an hour on the phone. It comes to be that he has an old, a couple old CJs and an old Wagoneer. And uh, he ends up emailing me pictures and the Wagoneer looked really rough. But I said, hey, uh, do you want to you trade your Wagoneer for my motor transmission? And I'll throw in whatever other parts you want from this Grand Cherokee. And so we got to talk in. He had to think about it for a couple days. And then he calls me and says, hey, I'll take the, I'll take the uh, motor and train if you'll come get this Wagoneer in my yard. And so uh, my buddy, my good friend Spencer actually came over here in his pickup. We loaded up the motor, tranny, skid plates. It was a brand new two row radiator, aluminum radiator, a bunch of other cool parts from that uh, Grand Cherokee. Um, we drive it down to this guy's house. He's about an hour away. We show up, it's actually running, which was amazing. We planned to drive it home almost like roadkill style because <laughs> the tires were like 30 years old and you could see flat spots in them and he just aired them up and he just hosed off all the dirt and spider webs. Interior was thrashed, it smelled funny. You could tell there was like tons of water damage. Like these roof, these roof seals didn't seal, the door seals didn't seal. Um, it had so much water damage that the wiring that goes under the floor had actually like rotted away. So none of the interior lights worked because you had like two sets of wire or one, one wiring loom that turned into two sets of wires that weren't touching anymore and grounding out to the body, which was very interesting. Um, it took me a while to diagnose that. Uh, finally ripped open the carpet and just started following all the wires around and sure enough found that, spliced that, cleaned up every single connection in the rig. I mean, I think I've spent 30 hours, weeknights after work going out there for a couple hours up to, up to 10 hours a night and just taking apart wiring connections with little tiny files, electric parts cleaner, sandpaper, scribes, and just cleaning off all of the rust and corrosion off every contact and every electrical part in this rig. And sure enough, over time, suddenly all the electrical started working. We suddenly had uh, lights when you turned the door on. We had the lights, or sorry, turn the door on, open the door. Uh, we suddenly had uh, interior lights working, like dash lights working, the seats would move up and down again and the uh, window motors started working. I actually took all the, all the door switches off in the beginning, one by one, took apart the door switch very carefully, took, went to the internals and there was just full of rust and corrosion and just sat there and filed. I took apart every single one of these switches internally, like literally took the internals apart of inside the switch and cleaned them. And then I also run uh, BJ's off-road electric window motors and I ran the new plastic tracks, rubber, they're like, well, they're not rubber, they're plastic. Got those from either BJ's or Team Grand Wagoneer. And I'm not a patient person, so this was, this was painful for me. But just sat there and filed away all the rust and corrosion. And then just threw like the tiniest, lightest coat, like just think of my fingers here, like the lightest little coat of dielectric grease uh, in there just to give it a little something. And over time, suddenly, it started to feel more like a regular car and it felt like it was coming back. Uh, from there, there was just so many mechanical failures. Like anything that was rubber had failed. The tranny mount was missing all the bolts and it was just kind of floating and it was rotten. 
Um, all the brake lines, all the soft rubber brake lines were rotten. The tires, once again, were rotten. Um, I ended up getting some tires from a buddy, some 30 inch tires that were cupped really bad. We couldn't balance them because the cupping and they just vibrated super bad. I ran those for a couple years just around town while I figured things out. Um, at one point, uh, I was able to get these, I mean, I call them Walmart tires. They're like the Patagonias. They were like a hundred, hundred bucks each, I think, or $120 each. And it just seemed like a good price point, especially cause I wasn't driving it a whole lot, but I need to get rid of that cupping to make sure I didn't have like driveline vibes or a transmission problem or motor mount issues or tranny mount issues. And uh, sure enough, it was just the tires. Um, and so anyways, we go through the rubber, chase a ton of fuel delivery issues. I was about to burn this thing down one day and ended up just sticking a fuel tank in the back, a gas can and ran a soft line to it from the fuel pump. And sure enough, it finally started running good. The story, the story there is crazy because we got it. I immediately took it to smog and it smogged perfect, which blew my mind. And then the next, like two years later, I go to smog it and it's backfiring. It wouldn't stay running. I couldn't drive it more than a quarter mile. It died on me in the middle of heavy dead stop traffic and 105 degree weather. And I had to put it in four low to keep it idling and limp it home like two miles an hour on the side of the road from like highway 174, just in four low. So it wouldn't die and just, like feathering the gas, like trying to, trying to find that sweet spot. And uh, I remember at one point while sitting there waiting for it to like, I thought it was vapor lock. I was waiting for it to like unvapor lock, waiting for the engine to cool, had the engine up. I had some water I threw on the, uh, on the manifold and around the carb and the air cleaner. I mean, it was like, that's all I had. I was doing what I could, it was 105 degrees out. And anyways, uh, I think finally some lady stopped and like followed me all the way home and she seemed really concerned for me <laughs> and I, the rig still was like rusted looked like hell the interior looked thrashed um i was surprised she even stopped to help that was really nice though so good for her anyways i get it home i think i spent like a year chasing carburetor issues and ended up being fuel delivery uh the soft lines coming out of the tank to the hard lines had rotted away internally and so that's how putting that fuel tank in the back seat, running some fuel line, it suddenly ran good out of nowhere. And I was ready to like burn this thing to the ground or like just give it away. I was so angry. I'd put so much time into fixing things. Once I got through that, it still had some issues with smogging. I replaced the uh, cat in the carburetor and I ended up getting like a new carb online remand for 200 bucks. Uh, I did, I had ordered 10 rebuild kits off of uh, Rock Auto and I kept blowing out uh, power valves, I believe. I think every it would backfire through the intake. We were still trying to figure out timing because all the vacuum lines were off. And so we were chasing around like fuel delivery and timing and it kept blowing out power valves and I would just like change the power valve out and it, we, we'd make some progress. And eventually through this crazy process, gave up on that carb and just threw a new carb on it and it actually fixed all those problems um, after we fixed fuel delivery and then uh, a couple years later i ended up throwing an electric fuel pump on it getting getting rid of the mechanical pump bypassing it and now it starts much easier uh, the mechanical pump seemed to seem like it, this thing sits for long periods of time and so uh the mechanical pump it just seems like it would take forever to prime whereas the electric pump i turn the key on i sit there for a minute and then pump the pump the pedal a few times and it seems to start up pretty easily once I've uh, once I've started it for a few days in a row and so anyways here we are um, God playing with timing and fuel delivery um, in the meantime I had replaced all the brakes wheel cylinder shoes spring kits front calipers pads uh, the booster was bad I could tell I'd be driving it and all of a sudden the pedal would go hard and then it would go soft again and I was like yeah that's a bad booster and uh, when I pulled the booster, I noticed the master was leaking into the booster. So I grabbed the new master. So it's got a new master, new booster. Um, while I was at it, I changed out the front soft lines that were rotten with YJ, four inch YJ Wrangler. So 87 through 95 uh, Wrangler brake lines for a four inch lift. Cause I had lifted it with some uh, J10 leaves that I put on it. So I'd gotten some J10 leaves for free off of a Wagoneer Facebook group. I'm on Sierra Nevada full size Jeeps. And I did it front and rear, netted an inch and a half, two inches of lift. It sat crazy low. I couldn't even lay under it. Um, it kind of helped getting it lifted up. Um, later on, I ended up getting a three and a half inch front leaf pack from a buddy on the full size, uh, Sierra Nevada full size Jeeps for like a hundred bucks. They're Skyjacker three and a halfs. Um, the shocks that are on it were like parts pile shocks that I had lying around. 
uh, the front sway bars are from a rear of a WJ 99 through 04 Grand Cherokee. Uh, the front sway bar end links that is. Uh, and then yeah, going into the steering, I guess now. So replaced <laughs> as we're going through sway bar end links and shocks and leaves, uh, replaced the uh, box about three times. All of the uh, parts house boxes were just junk out of the box. They wouldn't bleed. One of them didn't have turning to the left. One of them wouldn't turn at all. Finally, the third one after bleeding worked out great. Right. Hey, I had to run off. My buddy Mike stopped by. We were just talking about the Wagoneer. Probably should have got him on video, but he was like, my buddy Mike was saying, uh, as he stopped by, he was like, you have to document this thing. He's like, I remember what it looked like when you first got it. Compared to now, it looks brand new. So yeah, he hadn't even seen the, uh, the decals yet. So we'll talk about that soon too. Um, I think we'd left off at steering. So I had, I had chased uh, some weird steering centering issues and it turned out that I had at one point when I did the box put the, the rag joint on 180 off and so uh, I would bought a drop pitman arm and tried to adjust out the drag link and I just couldn't get the wheel centered and I'm like dude this doesn't make any sense you normally very little adjustment on the drag link centers the wheel and I was still 180 off and I had been reading through international full-size Jeep forums for a while and at one point I found a thread where someone talked about reg joint being 180 off. Sure enough, I go in there, rotate it, um, and it instantly was like really close and then I was able to adjust the drag link from there. But that was like a long time coming. I steered for a long time with the wheel off. It doesn't really matter. It's more of a cosmetic thing, but it was really nice to get it straight. Um, I have a pitman arm from Parts Mike. The tie rod end, so the drag link and tie rod are brand new. Stabilizers, brand new. The ball joints tested fine with all my testing. We actually did a bunch of testing in the JL video. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll have that pop up right here um, and leave a comment too if you're curious on fixing death wobble because we have a JL video on death wobble. All those death wobble issues apply to these. I've tried to help friends diagnose death wobble on their Wagoneers too. Um, anyways, getting back to the steering. So ball joints tested fine. Hub bearings were loose. I first got it and you could rock the tires back and forth. I thought the bearings were gonna be toast. I got it apart and they looked they looked fine. Um, I never had any bearing noise driving it. And so I just repacked the bearings and properly set the torque on the, uh, those inner jam nuts on the uh, spindles and no more play in the front end. And it, it seems tight enough. It still feels like there's slop somewhere. It's really weird. Even with like eight degrees of caster and an eighth inch of toe, um, all new steering and suspension except for the ball joints. And so I do have some new Spicer ball joints like sitting over there on the shelf that I got from BJ's off-road, I'll eventually slap those on, but I'm, I'm like not in a hurry. It steers good enough. I mean, it goes 70, not 70, 65 miles an hour on the freeway, like pretty straight. Like you're not that worried about it um, compared to when we first got it, where it was kind of all over the road. It had very little caster. All the steering was shot. The bushings and the suspension were shot. It had some rear steer going on with the shot bushings in the rear. The rear leaves were really soft and just causing the rear to be really squishy and kind of pushy around. And uh, I think all the shocks, all four shocks were blown out. <laughs> and so, yeah, that's all fixed now for the most part. I do need to get new shocks for it at some point. I'm probably gonna, I'll probably order them from BJ's at some point. Um, so anyways, we go from steering, suspension, uh, at one point I decided to chase down the cooling system. It wasn't overheating, but I did um, a new aluminum HD water pump, the two or three row radiator off eBay that everyone buys for these, and then a BJ's off-road cooling fan. I got rid of the, uh, the, uh, the solid fan and put in a HD fan clutch that I found on like a random thread after reading for hours on what people were doing to get rid of the, the solid fans. And someone was using like a Chevy fan clutch that was like a severe duty more than hd duty like locks up quick and stays locked up a lot but still unlocks when you need it to so you still get some power back and i did notice a slight power probably a noticeable power increase there and so the whole cooling system replaced all the hoses flushed it over 30 times with distilled water it was just full of crud the old radiator you could see from the cap it was just every fin inside was like clogged with like it looked like orange rtv and then just years of corrosion and like scale and so uh, cooling system was good. And then I started thinking, okay, brake system's good. Fuel system's good. I need to probably go through the power steering. So I ended up grabbing a new power steering pump and new power steering lines. I'd already done the box and all the steering. I just didn't want to be out when I finally get this thing out, either on the road or on the trail. I do take it to Jeep club meetups sometimes, but I didn't want to be out on a trail somewhere and just have like 
a power steering line burst or a power steering pump fail or a coolant line burst or the, the, the water pump go out. And so I just wanted to make sure all the rubber was good. All the, all the stuff that I could fix was in good shape. Uh, replaced the valve cover gaskets, um, followed some rule, some good tech tips on some of the international full size Jeep uh, threads where they talked about using some special, it's like RT, it's like a different type of RTV. Start with the H, I can't remember. I'll have to look it up, I'll have to look at it and maybe, maybe I'll like post it up top right there or down below and uh, what that was. But uh, no more leaks at the valve cover. I need to, I need to seal the oil pan. It doesn't leak like on the ground. It doesn't drip on the ground, so it's not a bad leak. But you can see it weeping. Um, it probably hasn't been replaced in 30 years. Uh, overall, the motor to me sounds okay. We got it. I mean, timing's dead dead on at right at the edge of smog legal. I think it's eight to 12 degrees or eight to 10 degrees that smog. They check at smog, so I think I have it right at 10 or 12, wherever, wherever that edge is to give it as much advance as possible. Um, what else? <laughs> I'm sitting here thinking, I'm like, what else do we need to cover? So I did build these rock sliders. I'm looking at those right now. Um, I knew I'd eventually take it on some light wheeling, nothing hardcore like the Cherokee, but uh, I didn't want to destroy the rockers. And so these are two by two, 120 wall with one by two, 120 wall legs, and then quarter inch plate and just meticulously tried to make it bolt on. Usually I would just burn in some legs and be done real quick, but I spent extra hours drilling out every hole. It has three legs, not just two, so it's pretty sturdy. 120 walls a little on the light side. I should have used maybe 188, like 3 16ths. But honestly, for what I'm gonna do with it, I'm like, yeah, the price was right. Um, I bought the steel way before COVID steel prices went up. And so, uh, God, it was like 80 bucks a stick or something, or 60 bucks a stick for 120, 120 wall from Del Paso Steel, which is over in Sacramento. And uh, you know, they do cuts for a couple bucks per cut. So I had them cut the, the sliders to length. So I just had to kind of notch the edges. And then I bought 20 feet of one by two and uh, just keep the spare steel around the garage for other projects. I keep, I try to keep two by two 120 and one by two 120 just in the garage at all times for projects. You never know when uh, one of your friends are gonna buy a Jeep and don't have any money and you're gonna have to build them some rock sliders. And uh, I've done that. Done that for my buddy Bill on his Cherokee and his Comanche and my buddy Dan. Uh, Dan welded them up, but we, I sourced the steel and helped figure you know, showed him the plan of what to do. And then built them for this, built them for my old Grand Cherokee. And uh, I usually just build them because it usually, if you're getting the 20 foot stick for 60, 70 bucks, uh, you could build a set of rock sliders for, I mean, half of that cost, plus the cost of the legs and some quarter plate. And so maybe I'm into rock sliders for $60. I don't know. I mean, overall, maybe. And so uh, no one really made them that I could find that were bolt on that were inexpensive, that price, nowhere close to that. Um, I made a transfer case cross member out of some six inch wide C channel that was quarter inch. And it didn't even get close to fitting because the uh, C channel coming up on the sides like stuck up into the T case. And I had to iteratively mock it up and then just use my cheap plasma cutter to torch and just kept torching chunks out until it would not hit the transfer case in the exhaust. And uh, it still seems insanely strong. It's quarter inch, most of the C channels there. Um, and then I just used some rib nuts into the frame rail to make it bolt on, like really easy bolt on. Normally I was, I would maybe bolt some angle to it or weld some angle to the frame rail and then drill and tap it maybe. But the rib nuts were just so quick and easy. And I, I've kind of started getting into rib nuts for projects now. I used to, I've never used them before. Um, I noticed like Metal Cloak uses a lot of rib nuts and I kind of like that just because um, it, you can make something bolt on really fast by drilling a hole and slamming in a rib nut. Um, I did have to fabricate some front toe points. It was really hard. I couldn't find any front toe point options for these. I wanted to mount them on the outside of the frame rails originally because I wanted to be lazy. And uh, I realized that was just not gonna work when you look at the clearance for the outside of the frame rails. I ended up welding and, bolt and using like six half inch bolts for a piece, a big piece of angle to go across the front cross member and then took some three bolt, not two bolt tow hooks, welded a piece of quarter to the bottom and then made my own flag nuts, hole sawed into the cross member and dropped some flag nuts in there and basically made a three bolt tow hook on the front for both sides. And it seems incredibly strong for, the tow hooks were probably 30 bucks. The steel, I mean, the steel was just scrap lying around. So the steel was, five bucks or something worth of steel. Um, 
and then hole sawing and ma making some flag nuts and stuff. Uh, it's just some time, but I mean, I don't have much money into those toe points. Um, what else? I mean, I've replaced a lot of the lights, the marker lights, the headlights, the tail lights, fixed all the bad wiring there. Um, so now we have like, you know, just all the lights work and they all look like they're almost brand new. Once again, too, it's really weird for me <laughs> to build like a nice looking rig because most of the rigs I've ever built were Cherokees that just get ran into the ground, smash in doors and windows. You swap, you slam another door or window on there after the run uh, and you just keep going and who cares what the body looks like. Whereas uh, this thing was more, let's make a cruiser that I could take on like forest roads. Like, but I also wanted some off-road capability and I wanted to be able to slide under it and work on it. So I lifted it, put some 31s. Uh, 31 inch Patagonia's, the Walmart tires, the Patagucci's, uh, they were super inexpensive, like 120 bucks a tire when I got them. And then uh, the front axle on this thing had a cat axle, central axle disconnect, but it was inside the differential housing. On the XJ's and YJ's, it's in the passenger side axle tube with a shift fork that kind of slides a collar over to lock into four wheel drive. Chrysler got rid of that either 91 in the XJs and 93 in the YJs, I think. It's a pretty terrible design. And then they happened, AMC did it one year, 83 only, in the differential. And so I'll have some pictures probably of the diff cover. <laughs> There's, there was like a, there was some bolts going through the diff cover. There was a shift fork in there. And there was like this massive like loom of, of all these vacuum lines going down into it. And it, it just seemed like it was prone to failure. I think it worked but there was also a vacuum actuator on the the mp229 that was on this that was prone to failure uh, and so i just didn't like any of that so i like ripped all the vacuum lines out i took the the axle shafts from a uh an 84 85 86 wagon or whatever just like anything after 83 slapped them in there the inner axle seal for a uh for just a newer 84 through 91 wagon ear worked on the outside axle seal for the cad axle part and so that was a cheap $10 seal to block off the axle. And I bought some Cromali axle shafts. Um, I don't know how this happened, but I'm on, I was on Rock Auto one day and uh, I looked and they had some chromos, like USA standard chromos for the Wagoneer. And it was like $15 rebate per chromo shaft. And they were sold individually, which usually you sell as a kit. And they were all between $60 and $80 each for the inners and outers. And it was $15 off. So I think I spent like 300 something bucks and then I got $60 in rebates back. So I got chromos in the front with the, with the air locker. So as I'm getting rid of that funky differential housing with this weird CAD thing in there, I was like, I really don't want to run that. I really want some kind of front locker. And I ended up getting a zip locker. Uh, Parts Mike up in Auburn, they're awesome. It was like right when, right when COVID hit, they sold me a zip locker and uh, slapped it in there just had to do backlash pinion depth was good the pattern looked fine i mean i just basically put i put backlash really close to where it was i remembered measuring i can't remember what it was and i think i gave it another one thousandth over what it was and uh you know you got to drill out the differential About it. um so yeah the air locker is amazing uh i do want to put an air locker in the amc 20 or maybe an eaton e-locker down the road i think that's the next plan and some 29 spline 1541 uh, semi float shafts. They're not, I think 1541 is what you want to use in semi floating, uh, I think, in a semi floating situation because it's not full float in the rear. And I think those are three to 400 bucks for the shafts. And I think, you know, selectable lockers aren't cheap. Um, it might be in a year or two or three that I do that. Um, I'll probably, when I do that, I'll probably do a video on it. Um, anyways, so this thing's come a long way to get mechanically sound. And as it started to run better and I'm driving it around, I know I was excited. I knew how cool it was. It looked a little rough around the edges. It just, old Wagoneers look cool, but this looked like it gone past the point of cool and looked, it looked rough. Uh, it was a little embarrassing to drive around in. And so we started talking about fixing up the paint. And so we ended up painting it and we decided to do, to do two-tone. One, one of the conditions of keeping it, not getting rid of it, was that my wife, I told my wife I'd paint it and I told her she could pick the colors. So we did like this, this cool like 70s green and we kept the top white, repainted that white. And uh, only recently did we put on these rad decals from a 74 Cherokee. BJ's makes them for, BJ's makes them for a four-door Wagoneer and they're super cool. Um, like it just made the rig pop even more. 
And so, yeah, the pain, I mean, that was, that's a whole video in itself. That was like a year out of my life that uh, I'll never get back. But yeah, almost a year of prep and primering and sanding and repairing damage and dents and uh, sourcing all of the weather stripping. We replaced all of the weather stripping in the whole vehicle, all the weather stripping in the rear tailgate, all the door weather stripping, um, the roof rack weather stripping, the door handles, the locks, put new locks in it when we did that. Um, the only thing I couldn't, for the tail, for the tail lights, they kind of had some weather stripping around them that was kind of falling apart. And I tried to use what I could find off the shelf and try to repair it a little bit and then use some RTV or some weather stripping glue adhesive. Um, what else did we have to seal up? I think that was most of it. I mean, yeah, these are new. Um, these are new. Actually, this one's old. The other one's new. These are a nightmare to replace. Don't ever, if your wing, if your wing windows leak, just let them be because there's, it's, you have to drill out a bunch of rivets in the door that are like really hard to, to get to. And everything that rotated and moved was rusted solid or broken. And so I had to get creative on repairing like the wing windows in, internally. And uh, I think looking back, I probably, I probably wouldn't have gone as far as I did with the paint. We should have just taped it off and shot it. Um, I don't think we should have done as much prep because it just took way too long. It looks good, but we had to repaint it twice. The uh, gun was spraying weird and piling up and causing all like, the whole rig was orange peeled after the first uh, shoot and it looked so bad and we hand sanded for three months. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, that was messed up. Uh, it looks good now though. It would be hard to get rid of this thing. We have crazy, crazy hours into it. I mean, just like so many hours. And then now we're at the point where I'm just doing little stuff. Like I replaced the door handle holder chingas with some billet ones from BJ's. Um, Cause those were like plastic. They hold the door handle on and they, they were breaking. They were all broken. Um, what else? God, so I think we've covered, oh, the interior. So anyways, we get that, we get the exterior looking really good. It's all sealed up and you go inside the Jeep and it feels like a dump. And so I ended up redoing the carpet, redoing, re buying new rear interior paneling and recovering those with new, with new uh, carpet as well getting a headliner from BJ's and I got these awesome cat skin seat covers from BJ's. And while I had those out, um, it was a couple hours, a couple hours to swap out all the seat covers. You have to cut off all the hog rings. It takes a while, take the seats out. It's not just a cover. It's like you actually replace like some of the foam and oh my God, the comfort level in there went up. And then while I had them out, I ended up putting in heated seat elements that I got on like Amazon Prime, wired those to a relay. Um, that's a whole nother story where I started adding relays to everything in this rig because nothing in the 80s was relayed. And that was a, it seems like a fire hazard. Um, I bypassed the ammeter when I was doing all that too. The ammeters would catch on fire instead of putting a voltage meter in there. And so um, I rewired the alternator setup so it bypasses that and doesn't send high current into the dash that could catch on fire, which if you Google, if you Google these, uh, Google like ammeter swap or, or ammeter bypass for full size Jeep. And you'll see what I'm talking about. Like people have had the dash catch on fire and then the whole rig burns down. And I wanted to avoid that. And so, yeah, there's a new starter solenoid, uh, a bunch of new wiring in there. I put like high gate, like really big gauge wiring coming off the alternator to the uh, starter solenoid. And I think, I think that's in good shape now. And it's, God, I mean, it charges no problem. I just don't drive it enough. I really wish I drove it more. Um, so interior, that had to source all kinds of interior parts on like eBay and Facebook groups. I got the door cards off of eBay and I got tons of little pieces of the nutmeg interior, like random pieces from random people. So, so anyways, uh, redid the whole interior. Now the interior looks really good. Um, got it like a dash pad because the dash where the old speaker was had crushed in when I was putting the windshield in, uh, putting the windshield back in. Um, new windshield trim at the same time. I'm like, what else is in here? We, I put a modern radio. I went to pick and pull one day too and grabbed a center console from like a Ford Explorer and uh, wired like a USB port to that. And because the, the, there was like the factory uh, little center seat that's like this narrow, took that out, put a center console in with some power to it and then made like a very, very primitive uh, ARB switch mount for the ARB. And at one point we had the AC working and I actually wired a pusher fan and made some mounts for that and wired that to a switch in the dash. So when I turn on the AC, 
if it's really hot out and it seems like, I don't know if the rig's getting a little hot or if the AC is not working that good, I have a pusher fan in front along with that severe duty fan clutch and the pusher fan should hopefully help push more air over the uh, AC condenser. I need to get, I need to convert this thing to 134 and just make life easier. Um, you can't even get R12 in California anyway. So, I mean, there's no, there's no options there. It worked, I think for a little bit at one point and then it stopped. So I'm sure we need to go through the whole AC system. I've been looking at stuff on BJ's and Rock Auto and Team uh, Grand Wagoneer for parts on uh, just buying all new parts and doing doing that conversion. That's like the last lingering thing that keeps the keeps me from driving it in the summer because it's it's pretty hot in there, <laughs> um, and it's left me stranded so many times. Uh, one time on that, I, I don't. Yeah, one time on a 105 degree day, uh, the transfer case exploded. Um, on a highway near my house. I was going to take it to a buddy's shop to smoke test the intake because I was chasing some smog issues. And the uh, transfer case decided to explode. And when I got it home, I thought it was the tranny. Um, just, it, it came to an immediate stop with just the most horrible metal on metal explosion grinding noises and just dumped tranny fluid on the highway. I limped it off to the side. It was, it was horrible. Called, called AAA, we still had the toes with AAA. Got it towed home was really bummed out, sat around, I think, went out to the garage and I was like, well, I gotta pull the tea to the tranny. So I drained the tea case and very little fluid came out. And I was like, that's weird. And then all of a sudden chunks of metal chains started coming out. The chain had grenaded and pieces of the chain were coming out like in pieces. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. I found the answer uh, really quickly. So thank God, uh, but I gotta pull a 229 now. And I don't wanna put another 229 uh, full-time case in there because they have a viscous coupler that fails. I think that might have seized up or maybe that's the, the ridiculous shift linkage that I had to make. The, the throw on the shifter is like an eighth of an inch or a quarter inch because it had that vacuum actuator I mentioned for the cat earlier. And so uh, I ended up researching it and I found out that, you know, the, I measured the input shaft and it's like 2.3 inches. Well, some, some TJs from like 2000, 2001 had a, a 2.3 inch long input shaft and they're 23 spline just like these. And so uh, I took, I, dumb luck, found a 231 long input from a TJ with like 80,000 miles on Craigslist or Facebook market for like 200 bucks. And it was only like an hour and a half away. Ran over there, got that, ordered, I think a Rubicon Express Slippy Oak Eliminator kit. And uh, I was able to put the Slippy Oak Eliminator on it. it was, I called Tatten Driveline in Utah. A lot of XJ guys use them because he has really good pricing. He does heavy duty slip joints, super long travel HD slip joints, 120 wall tubing, brand new U joints. And it was like $165 for that brand new shaft. It was gonna cost me more than that to have my old shaft lengthened and retubed with probably like whatever 095 wall or, or maybe thinner. I was still gonna have to buy U joints too because it was an old shaft and the slip joint was probably worn out. It's 30, 40, 50 years old uh, on, the, uh, on the slip joint. So, I was like, oh, thank God. So four or $500 later, uh, four or five, yeah, I think by the time I was done with the drive shaft, the T-case and the slip yoke eliminator kit, uh, which the slip yoke eliminator kits are really easy to install. Pull the case, put it on the workbench right here in front of you and uh, pop the case open, replace the output shaft, comes the new tail cone housing and a yoke, seal the case up, put all that together and you're pretty much good to go. And you can, you can remove the case in about half an hour to 45 minutes on, uh, on this. It's not too bad. And then slap the new case in and then measure for your drive shaft. And uh, oh my God, having two, a true two wheel drive and then getting rid of the drive slugs in the hubs and putting on lockout hubs. And then instead of all this weird linkage that I had to make originally to work with all the funky vacuum stuff, I just made my own shifter. And I used like a, like a Speedway Motors uh, shifter handle and it was like 20 bucks and then I bought I think at Aziz Design Works XJ231 shifter linkage kit and those are like 60 bucks that was part of the pricing I guess and uh, now I have like manual shifting I mean you could feel the gear you're in you know you're in two-wheel drive you know you're in neutral you know you're in or four high and four low like it just feels positive feels definite like you're in it um, whereas before it was just like you didn't even know because the throw was so short you would like barely move the shifter and you're like you go from like four high to four low. It was, or maybe that was two to four on the vacuum and then four high, four low was a lever. Either way, it was sketchy. And uh, I don't, I still to this day don't know if that contributed to the case exploding. If you follow on the Wagoneer groups too, you're gonna see that a lot of people have 229s explode on the road. 
uh, out of nowhere. And I know a guy that went through a couple of them and ended up going to a 208 out in Nevada. Uh, I sold him a 208 that my buddy Spencer had sold me. Uh, and that's, I should have kept that case, but the 231 worked out just fine. Um, these things have less horsepower from the factory than like a nine, 1990 Cherokee. I think that, I think the horsepower rating was around 170. It might be wrong. You guys can look that up and quote me on that and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought it was like around 170 with all the smog equipment and how choked down these are. And, uh, anyways, so I think that was some of the more recent failures. Uh, you know, the, uh, the fuel lines that left me stranded when the fuel lines completely failed internally clogged up when I finally got those fuel lines apart, uh, eventually after diagnosing it for a long time, uh, the, the rubber lines were literally mush. It would look like jello, but black, it looked like black jello inside the fuel lines and no fuel was getting through. And, uh, yeah, that was another time where I got left stranded where there was just no fuel delivery and I was filling up the cheap plastic, uh, fuel filters, the little like $2 ones. Uh, I was filling those up within a quarter mile. I would drive around the block, basically barely make it home. It would try to die 10 times getting home, going around the block. I would get home and the fuel filter was full of black sludge. And I thought it was just sludge in the tank, but it ended up being those soft lines and probably, probably sludge in the tank too, but those soft lines had no, no fuel getting through them. And so if you're, if you're dealing with fuel delivery problems on an old rig, my recommendations are if you get an old vehicle, no matter what it is, if it's 20, if it's been, if it's been sitting for 10, 20, 30 years, Replace all the rubber, fuel lines, brake lines, cooling system, uh, fuel delivery, which includes carburetor, fuel pump. Uh, you're gonna wanna replace your brake master, anything to do with your power steering, uh, your belts. I mean, I did all the belts. They were a couple bucks each on, on Rock Auto. That was, that was one of the first things I did. That was cheap and easy. But yeah, tires, uh, wheel cylinders, calipers, anything that has rubber in it, you're gonna have to replace. And you're probably gonna have to rip through all the wiring and fix all the wiring problems. And so anyways, that's kind of, I think that's roughly where we're at now. Like I said, me and my wife put these decals on this last fall and it really made the vehicle like pop. Um, the wood grains, I want to say between 1500 and 2000 for the wood grain and these 74 Cherokee decals from BJ's for a Wagoneer were like 160 bucks, I think. Um, maybe they're a little more than that. Maybe they're more now. I don't know. It's been a while. And so, uh, yeah, here we are just lots and lots of work. I mean, I have, I have countless hours into polishing all the, uh, all the handles and the rims. Each rim probably has a couple hours into it, polishing it. Uh, the roof rack polishing every piece with a hand drill and those little, you can get like these, these polishing ends, these like polishing kits for drills on Amazon really cheap. And I think I went through two or three 30 packs of the little like uh, wool. They're like little, you want to use wool, I think, to get rid of all the gnarly stuff. And then I would go down to some, some buffing compound. Um, I was using, I think I was using cutting compound and then, and then machine glaze or something after that on these, on a drill. And it was just sitting there for hours. And, and cause yeah, all the, <laughs> it's hard to picture now, but like everything that's kind of shiny now, it's still, it's still not even perfect, but everything that's kind of shiny was like, looked like it was just destroyed and corroded and covered in dirt and rust. I don't know, you know, it just looked terrible. And so anyways, uh, I think we've covered it all. I just need to drive it more and fix the AC. Um, and I do, I do look at the how fuel injection at least once a month on BJ's website. And I've looked at the Holly sniper and I've looked at the Edelbrock injection, which comes with like a new intake. And I've, Oh God, I've tried to look into like, I mean, this is like blasphemy from the AMC guys, but a lot of guys, five, three LS five, three swap these things and get nine, 18, 19 miles of the gallon. And that, that LS swap, it's going to be expensive, but it might not be as expensive as you think. If you could do a lot of, if I could, I'll do all the work myself, if I can get a donor vehicle and park them side by side and just swap everything over, but getting that to pass uh, California bar Bureau of automotive repair, uh, inspection I heard can take up to two years of just nightmares. And so I think getting a carb legal, like how injection kit sounds really attractive because they can bolt it on in a weekend and uh, be off and running. And I know maybe it's not the best setup, but it might be better than what some of the issues I'm having with the carb where it, it, it still wants to cut out sometimes. So the first like half an hour of driving, it'll just die. Um, I keep chasing timing and carb stuff. The 2150s are pretty easy to, to adjust. Um, so I think that's it. So this is going to be the first video 
of a vintage camping series as well. So the first video is like introducing you to my Wagoneer. And I do wanna start acquiring a, more vintage camping gear. I do collect some vintage coolers, vintage stoves, vintage lanterns. I wanna try to find some old, some old canvas tents maybe. Um, we do go to thrift stores and antique stores looking for that stuff from time to time. So I wanna do like a vintage camping series where I try to get some old iron from some other buddies and we go out and whatever old Jeeps we have or any old rig and just do some easy forest road camping, no hardcore wheeling, so I don't really wanna hurt this thing. But that's gonna be coming up soon. Um, check out my other videos. I got some more coming up on trail tools that I bring in my crawler, and I'll probably cover the tools that I bring in this thing everywhere, and I'll probably cover tools that I bring in my Wrangler as well. So each rig has a drastically different tool set. Um, this thing is more geared towards like a carburetor rebuild kit and uh, a pretty simple wrench and socket set. The Wrangler's like basic wrenches and sockets and some tie rod end pullers. The Cherokee's got like impacts and grinders and welding gear and all kinds of crazy specialty tools because we have to fix like crazy weird stuff on the Rubicon that I would probably never have to deal with with this thing. Um, and I think that's what's gonna come up next. Subscribe and share it if you can, if you got that extra 20 seconds. I would appreciate it personally. I am trying to grow the channel and trying to reach out. I do, I'm gonna be covering Wagoneer stuff Cherokee rock crawler on one ton type of stuff and uh, JL mild wheeling and just camping gear stuff and then camping gear for this camping gear for the Cherokee tools for all the rigs S tons I have tons of review videos I plan on doing tons of work videos there's there's constant work on all three of these rigs and uh, once the snow melts in the Sierras once we get rid of that 15 feet or so at some of the trails I plan on running um, all my trail running plans are canceled for the next month or two. Uh, so yeah, once we start running trails, I'll get a bunch of trail running videos. I'm going to try to do video, trail running videos in all three of these rigs this summer. So stay tuned for that stuff too. If you subscribe, you're not going to miss them. So I appreciate that. Thanks again, everyone.